Okay, let's open with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, again, as we open up these scriptures, Lord, we ask your guidance that the Spirit of God would work in our lives that we can understand more. And, Lord, that it would not be just an intellectual knowledge, but, Lord, that it would gravitate to our feet and be incorporated right into our very walk. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Right, well, we're in 1 Corinthians and chapter 16, and um, I'm hoping to finish off the, the book of 1 Corinthians today, and this will most likely be our last in the series. And so this is um, part 44. So we've had quite a few sermons on 1 Corinthians. Uh, right near the end uh, of the slide series, I've put a slide in there which um, gives you a link to a, to a place on rightdivision.com where you can see a series of uh, messages I gave in New Zealand called Occupy Till I Come and uh, Occupy Till He Come. And you'll see in there a great synopsis of some of the major points that we learn in 1 Corinthians because there's some really, really good material in there and it would be good to get a kind of a synopsis of those things and that's a good link so last time we um, we looked at some passages um, relating to this death is swallowed up in victory and I asked the question when will it be when will that saying be brought to pass well very clearly the context here is the resurrection there is no doubt at all that that's what it refers to so death being swallowed up in victory occurs at the resurrection now, we can talk about the fact that we have victory in Christ, but that's looking towards that time. We can say we have it because it's certain. We can say it because we have the prophetical now, and because we are, we're in the body of Christ, of whom Christ is head, we know we have a specific resurrection which is going to happen. And whether it be to various rewards, a special resurrection, or part of a more general resurrection, the point is we have life. We do have life as a gift. And that life is fulfilled in resurrection. That's the point. Um, and we talked about this idea of the flesh of Christ that in, in uh, many ways very different, very different, because uh, Christ did not have to die. He died because he took on the sin of the world, but he had no sin himself, and uh, so his flesh was not corruptible. Um, over here it says, now concerning. And we saw this, that that particular phrase uh, is repeated through some passages. And um, there are some very important imperatives that come up in this particular passage um, which relate to uh, the Jews and how that the Jews, because they had need, it was also important that the various Gentile churches would supply their need because they as Gentiles were partaking of Israel's spiritual things. Uh, these things are quite clear in the scriptures. I mean, they're just written in black and white, but they were never made clear. In many, many talks that I've heard concerning 1 Corinthians, they, know they never were brought out. Um, so today, let's go to chapter 16 and verse 10. It says this, Now if Timotheus comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. And isn't this a tremendous thing that Timothy the younger man could work in the same way that Paul worked. And we can work in the same way that Paul worked if you rightly divide the word of truth. Because we can't, we can't work in the same way that Paul worked during the book of Acts. We don't have the gifts of the Spirit. We do not have those. Paul did. He was involved with miraculous signs and wonders and all these manifestations. We don't have them. So when we see Timothy, yes, he worked as Paul also worked. Yes, we can work as Paul worked as long as you recognize that Paul had another work, a prison ministry. 
And so we can work after a similar fashion also. And he goes on and he says, Let no man therefore despise him. Because uh, there's lots of reasons why that could take place. We get a hint at it when we read later on Paul's post-Acts ministry concerning Timothy. And he talks there about, you know, don't let anyone despise thy youth. So he's a young man. And perhaps sometimes when we look at the younger men, we think, well, what do they know? The point is that God can use someone in their youth and uh, can give them a great understanding and wisdom. It says, uh, but conduct him forth in peace that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. And Paul had a very special relationship with Timothy. Down here, I've got uh, listed these names, Timothy, Apollos, Stephanus. Fortunatus, Achaicus, Aquila, and Priscilla. These names come up in this last portion. Now, here's another study, which, as far as I know, has not been done. Paul typically does this sort of thing as he gives his final salutation. As he draws to an end of his epistles, he then draws together various witnesses, various personal testimony, Various commentation concerning individuals. Very practical usually. And it would be a great study, I think, to take all these and look at the ends of his epistles and see what practical instruction you can find and how it differs uh, going across the Acts 28 boundary. It would be a good study. But these are very, very interesting because you find various statements like Timothy, don't despise, don't despise him. Apollos, his will, at this time, is not convenient for him. He made up his own mind, Apollos, that he would not come. But Paul says that, you no, know, in his own time, uh, according to his own convenience, he'll, he will come. And then you have Stephanus. He was the first fruits uh, of Achaia. And all three of these, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Caiacus, they were used in some way of filling up that which lacked of the Corinthians' performance. That's, the, that's the, the signature thing that those three did. And then when you come down to Pris, Aquila and Priscilla, you find mention made of a church in their home. And if you go back in the scriptures, there's lots you learn about this couple. So you've got individuals, you've got a young one, and then you've got a couple. And this couple was mightily used to witness out to people. And I think about, you know, um, our own ministry and how, uh, as we read through this, you're going to find that people made their own decision as to what ministry they would be a part of. They did it themselves. They addicted themselves to whatever ministry. And if, as you come down a little bit further, um, verse 12, it says... As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. And what is meant convenient would be in the context of whatever else he was doing. Uh, sometimes there's an excuse we can make, make about convenient time, right? <laughs> What's convenient? Well... Convenient sometimes is what just fits into my sort of schedule of laziness. Uh, that can happen. We'll give Apollos the benefit of the doubt because Apollos was a man who was mighty in the Scriptures. And we can see in the book of Acts that he was mightily used. And Priscilla and Aquila were used to bring him on unto perfection. And let's give him the benefit of the doubt perhaps that yes, this was to work in with a godly schedule. Verse 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men. Uh, just going back to the front slide here, that's the one there. And I want you to look at this. This is, this is all imperative. See, this is a command. Watch ye, all right? watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. Then comes a very interesting thing. Quit 
you like men. Andrasestha. You know, one word in the Greek, but it's full of meaning. And how politically incorrect of Paul to write this. You know, how politically incorrect. Quit you like men. In other words, it's common knowledge what a man was. Common knowledge. And he's appealing to that. Do the man thing. Do the man thing. And he goes on and he says, be strong. Well, that goes very much with the man thing. Or it should be. But what we have today is this airy, fairy sort of stuff that brings down the strength of the man and sort of somehow makes women more masculine so that the two somehow meet between and then there's this, this grayness in between there that no longer is this partition between the man and the woman. Now, what I'm saying now is so politically incorrect. I mean, with people today, we would just divide the room if we spoke like that to her. And yet it's just so obvious, isn't it? It's so obvious and so right. And more than ever, we need to proclaim it. We need to proclaim these things. Paul says it. Quit you like men. Be a man. There is such a thing as a man. There is such a thing as a woe man. They are different. And they should be different. Thank God for the differences. Let's be who God intended us to be. And he goes on, he says, let all your things be done with charity. And I find this just beautiful. How that now, he doesn't just leave that up to your own imagination as to what it would mean, say, to be a man. To be a man does not contradict the idea of doing all things with charity. It doesn't contradict that. It's a part of it. To be a man doesn't mean to be a bully. It doesn't mean... To treat people disrespectfully. Um, in here, I've got a picture of some of the scenes that accompany the founding of the nation. And when you look at the lives of some of these men, they were men. They were prepared to die for the cause, to protect their family, to protect their nation. Men. And I think it's a great thing to see. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Addicted, what does that mean? It means they, adore, they ordained themselves. They set themselves to the ministry of the saints. They made a decision. They took the initiative, and they took the responsibility and they went for it. Mr. Welsh in the John Birch Society, 1958, the, the year I was born, he took the initiative and he did it. He did it. Same here. These people addicted themselves. See what it says? Themselves. Addicted. Ordained themselves. Set themselves to the ministry of the saints. They made a choice, they made a decision. We all must make decisions in our lives as, as to how we are going to run this race. And understanding the Word of God rightly divided. Man, does it help clarify things and help you to say, well, I'm not going to be a part of that ministry. Can't be a part of that. No, no, that's not right. No, I can't be a part of that. But what I can be a part of is this. And I'm going to do this. And do something with your life. Man, Champ and I were talking, you know about men ourselves specifically you know as you grow older as a man and I don't know that this is true but I suspect that it's true that when as a man you grow older your mind still stays kind of where it was in your mid twenties you know what I'm saying and you forget the fact that the body's going down man it's a 50-year-old body, but the mind, I know it's true of me. I think I can still do these things, and I have to say, wait a minute, look in the mirror, man. You can't do that now. 
You cannot do that. That's gone. That opportunity has gone. That was a part of your life and the time has gone. Okay, so you shouldn't be all sad about it. You should face up to that reality and say, okay, well, I can't do that, but I can do this. And this is my stage of life. This is where I am. And this is how I can make my mark. You know, you have to be real. And sometimes, man, it's, it's, it's eating some sour pudding, I'll tell you, sometimes. But the facts are there and we have to face them. And then we can make a better choice in our life. And it goes on um, in verse uh, 16, it says, That ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Submit yourselves. Hey, that's a good thing too, isn't it? If you see someone who has addicted themselves to the correct ministry, and you can't see how perhaps you will take some place of leadership, but you see someone else who really has... And you, and you can see that, man, I can take a part of that. Okay, submit yourselves to them. Get in behind what they're doing. Get in behind it. The Kiwis have a, have a saying when they're talking to the sheepdogs. Get in behind! <laughs> Get in behind. And these dogs will do that. You know, they'll, they'll take a command. They're, they're intelligent dogs. These border collies. And they'll go behind and they'll get behind the cattle or the sheep, and they'll do that, and they know exactly what to do. I've seen instructions being given, and this is a true story, I've seen instructions given to a border collie by a farmer who has multi-thousand acre sheep station in the South Island of New Zealand, and he gives instructions to this dog with his whistle, and give it, and the dog runs off. Runs off, man. Gone! For the day, farmer goes back to his house, does whatever he's doing. In the evening, here's that dog bringing in the flocks, getting in behind, bringing them in. It's unbelievable that you could train an animal to do that. Just imagine, you know, the kind of picture we have in there for us too, spiritually, that what effect we can have on the flock. Ivan Bowen just came in. Ivan Bowen is a New Zealand uh, sheep. Uh, he used to be involved with uh, shearing sheep. He used to win all sorts of prizes for being the fastest uh, sharer of sheep. And uh, he's a Christian man. And he specialized in the Psalms. And you talk about the flock. And you give many talks. I don't know whether his, his stories are online. But he's a fine guy. I met him once at a camp. Verse 17. I am glad... Of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. They supplied your lack. And that, that has to do with the same idea that Paul uses in relationship later on to the filling up. The filling up to the full. And these people were involved with that filling up to the full. Now in a greater sense... Can't we be used to bring the knowledge of the mystery which fills to the full the Word of God? That's the spiritual picture we're getting from this, you know. Sure, we can be used in a practical way in all sorts of different features and characteristics and examples we can bring to. But there is this matter of right division and the fact that a sacred secret has been imparted to us through Paul the prisoner, and what we want to do is bring it to other people. We need to fill to the full their understanding of the Word of God. We need to do it. We can be like this, Fortunatus and Achaicus and Stephanus. Verse 18, For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Isn't it true that you can get your spirit refreshed? Have you had your spirit refreshed? I mean, I know what it's like to, ha to sort of feel the bodily refreshment uh, that comes when you've got a fit body, when you're absolutely 100% fit. I have had that. I've had that experience in my life. It's gone now. <laughs> but I've had it. I remember it. And, man, it's, it's an amazing thing. But I've also had this freshness of the Spirit where... You come to appreciate where you're going, your security in Christ, and furthermore, the wonderful knowledge 
of the revelation of the mystery. Man, a fresh start as a Christian, as a Christian. And that freshness of the Spirit, man, it's a great thing. And it says um, and in verse 18, For they have refreshed my spirit in yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. We need to acknowledge those that have been involved with such ministry that are in this to refresh us. We need to be a part of this. WriteDivision.com There's a place where the world can go and find some refreshment, where their spirits can be refreshed. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now, isn't it interesting that this salutation is going from one church to another, from a couple to a church, that there's this refreshment going on, the salutation going on between churches. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe in the future, we can have kind of like a refreshment here and salutation here in some sort of convention, some sort of conference on right division. Maybe in the future we can do it. You know, We don't need a fantastic number of churches to attend. We can have a few. You know, then they're still around. I know they're scarce as hen's teeth. But I mean, they are around. <laughs> How many teeth do I, does it? <laughs> okay, verse 20. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Wow, we can get into that. Well, there is a holy kiss, right? And then there's a Hollywood kiss. They're not the same. Okay, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. Now, here we come to an interesting thing. That here, the amanuensis, the, 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 the one that was like the secretary that wrote down the, the words with the quill and the ink onto the parchment. They would write it down as Paul would di dictate it. But Paul says, as he comes to his salutation, he says, hold the phone, man. I want people to see that what this thing that's been written down by you guys does come from me. And so he takes the quill and he writes with his own hand. Now, we're not privileged to see that because that, that's gone, right? But fortunately for us, because of the providence of God and His promise to preserve His word, we've got it here. He says, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be, ar be anathema maranatha. That's accursed at Christ's coming in Syriac. Isn't it interesting that now he's using words which would be more associated with the Hebrew people? Well, it's not surprising because the, the coming of Christ is from a Hebrew perspective. It's got to do with the hope of Israel. And he says this, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. There it is. That's the typical ending of Paul on all his epistles. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus Amen. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. What a beautiful way to finish with love, grace, and care. Amen. These words were said truly. Amen means this. Amen and amen. Verily, verily, truly, truly. And this is a true statement and record of the Word of God. It's a tremendous book. And we have learned so much through it, uh, Timothy, Paul's beloved son, Apollos, mighty in the scriptures, Stephanus, supplier and first fruits, uh, For Fortunatus and Achaicus. Here it is, fill to the full these ones who were used to help fill up that which is lacking that the Corinthians did not supply. And Aquila and Priscilla, the great helpmeets. Go right here, my friends. Here is some messages that I gave in New Zealand and I know you've seen some of them here but probably not all of them but this was more or less the synopsis of the great things that we had discovered in the book of 1 Corinthians and uh, I was quite happy to give that and I know that a lot of people have been downloading from this particular series well that's it 
That's it for First Corinthians for now, but we'll no doubt come back again. Next series I hope to do will be Man, His Nature, and His Destiny. Let's finish with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee, Lord, for all that we have learnt, all that You have shown us. We ask, Lord, that uh, we would be a blessing to others, that we would bring refreshment of spirit to others as we show the Word of God rightly divided. We pray that we'd continue to understand. We think of our children. Lord, we ask you to bless them and keep them on the right path and their children also, that they would come to know the knowledge of the truth and that they would stay strong and firm and that we'd see, Lord, a revival come back to America through our efforts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.